welcome and we are glad to have you be part of this panel presentation and this is such a phenomenal moment that we're having i'm sure that there will be lots of sharing discussion and also learning opportunities and before i'm going to introduce our panelists and also read to you the abstract for this panel presentation, just to have a gist of what this um, panel is about. I just would like to remind everybody that you can actually, you know, feel free to type in your comments, your thoughts, whatever clarifications or questions that you may have along the way. And then we will revisit and go over them during the question and answer portion after all our three panelists you know, are finished with their sharing, if that's okay. Um, just make sure to indicate, you know, um, which panelists you would like to address your comment. Could be to all three of them or to one of the three. Okay, so welcome once again. Um, this is a panel presentation on global mediation team. And there will be quite a diverse, but very much interrelated, extremely timely, relevant, with a sense of urgency in terms of topic and themes, you know, that will be presented and shared with all of us. So we are grateful to have with us um, Raju Bhatt, who is the CEO of the Global Mediation Team. Raju, if you don't mind, okay, there you go. Um, and VRAR Association, that's Virtual Reality for Good. Thank you, Raju, and welcome. We would also like to welcome, and we are happy to have with us, um, Julie Gregory. Hello, Julie. Um, Julie Hi, is, yes, <laughs> Julie is connected with the uh, Protecting Civilians and Human Security at the Stimson Center. And she's the author of Virtual Reality and the Future of Peacemaking. It's really a pretty interesting topic here. You know, the dynamic interplay between peacemaking and virtual reality, given the world we live in today. And the third and final panelist or discussant or presenter is Danish Masood Alavi who is joining us all the way from London. Um, welcome, Danish. Danish is technologist of the um, United Nations Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs Innovation Cell. So welcome, welcome to all our panelists this afternoon. So as we all know, the United Nations has taken a groundbreaking approach to invoke empathy, and inspire action by harnessing the power of virtual reality technology. Through immersive experiences, the United Nations aims to transport viewers to the front lines of global issues, providing a first-hand encounter with the challenges faced by marginalized communities worldwide. By donning virtual reality handsets, or headsets, individuals can step into the shoes of refugees fleeing conflict zones. They can witness the devastating effects of natural disasters or explore the daily struggles of those living in extreme poverty. These emotionally charged encounters evoke a sense of empathy that traditional media formats often struggle to achieve. And as a result, Virtual reality serves as a powerful tool for the United Nations to connect people on a personal level, compelling them to take meaningful action and advocate for positive change. This innovative approach to storytelling has the potential to revolutionize the way the world perceives and addressing present global issues, and addresses present global issues, forging a path a toward a more compassionate and empathetic global community. And so once again, welcome everybody. I think we are ready now to call on our first panelist, Raju Bhatt. 
Raju, take it away. Thank you, Professor Al. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. And thank you for being the sponsor of this program. Um, I want to remind just everybody that our theme for the week is building peace in partnership. I'll just read this one little item. Uh, and it says, sustaining peace, promoting justice requires building partnerships from different types of actors from global to local. Such, such partnerships between academic institutions, policy makers, practitioners, and regional organizations increase legitimacy, adaptability, and responsiveness to societal challenges. Partnerships also increase participation and meaningful inclusion of peace building actors with different profiles and mandates. Of course, there's problems. Sometimes it's hard to achieve, but this is what this week is all about is how to foster partnerships and peace. So having said that, I wanna thank GMU and the Fall Peace Week. I wanna thank our special speakers, Julie and Danish. They come from a very uh, uh, specific uh, technical background. So we were looking forward to listen to them. And I will, I'm coming from uh, a different background. I don't have that technic, a technical background in, in virtual reality. And why am I bringing this up? Uh, because virtual reality is really a subset of AI. Mm. Artificial intelligence is huge. And virtual reality is very, very thin. And both of these people have had extensive background experience in virtual reality or researching virtual reality. Um, at the United Nations this week, they're talking about that, how to separate the hype from what is reality, what can be implemented at a larger scale. And that's really important uh, for AI for good. There's a lot of ongoing programs uh, that they are working on in AI. And actually, Danish is going to mention something about that towards the end of the program. I am a member of VR AR Association, Virtual Reality Associate, uh, Augmented Reality Association. And we have a committee called Virtual Reality for Good. We also have a, a committee called Storytelling because we're interested in telling stories. This is all about telling stories. And whose stories are we telling? Not our own, <laughs> we're telling the stories of the ones who need to be heard. Um, Empathy, Julie's going to talk more about this in a little bit. Empathy has been shown to evo evoke uh, the othering effect. You step into these shoes of the other person. Uh, you're able to have a immersive reality experience. And in that immersive reality experience, you're able to heal this story better. Um, my background, I'm just going to share one little thing about my background. I grew up in London, in Texas, and even though I'm an Indian, I would meet South Asians everywhere I grew up, and I would connect with them. And it kind of confused me that we had so many different conflicts later between uh, the different countries, especially between India and Pakistan. Uh, and Pakistan and Bangladesh and the things that were going on in Sri Lanka. It was really hard to see all those conflicts take place. For me, being an Indian, being brought up in the West, we all have the same cultural background. We all have a similar cultural uh, interest. And at one time, all those cultures used to be able to coexist. So there was a kind of artificial thing that was created, I should say. I don't know what to really call it, but it was something artificial that was created that created separation between all different uh, ethnic groups. Uh, some want to blame the British, but I think there's a lot more uh, dynamics involved in, than just that. Um, so for me, I wanted to find a way to bring empathy to this condition of why everyone feels so separated. 
especially South Asians, uh, when those differences were so artificially created. So fast forward, the pandemic happens, and I'm uh, <clears throat> I run into Julie's uh, paper about virtual reality and peacemaking. And it starts getting me thinking about how this might be a tool for the future and how exciting that could be. Um, there are limitations, but there's also some great opportunities. So I contacted a professor in Kashmir and asked him if he'd be willing and interested to work on a pilot project with me on Kashmir. Let's do a virtual reality uh, immersive experience of what Kashmir looks like today. Let's get the students involved. Create a, 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 a create a um, a project here that they could see what the create uh, what it could look like in twenty thirty. And so there's a gap of seven years here. And in that gap, there would be a jump from point A to point B. And in that point A to point B, that would give people opportunities to see what kind of action would be necessary in order to get from point A to point B. So we're kind of excited about this project. Um, we're also going to have a version of virtual reality to see what would Kashmir look like if we only met 50% of the SDG goals. What would Kashmir look like in 2030 if we met 75% of the SDG goals? But we want to have an immersive experience. So it would catapult people to action because once you're able to have that immersive experience, you can see, wow, okay, this is, you know, this is real. <laughs> uh, and it, it, it's a call for action. Currently, we're 15% of the way to meeting the SDG goals. And we have seven years to go. So we've got to meet 85% of our goals in the next seven years. There's a realistic chance we might not meet all our goals. Um, I want to leave some takeaways, leave you some takeaways from the uh, UN meetings this week for the last couple of minutes here. Uh, if you don't have peace, you don't have an economy. So SDG goal number 16 is very, very important. And a lot of you probably know this, but there's a very different, there's a difference between peacekeeping and peace building. You know, peacekeeping is eliminating conflict. Peace building is creating positive peace. There is a huge need for talent in these areas. There's a big, big talent gap in the South. They're not only having an innovation gap, not only having a financial gap, but they're also having a talent gap. So students out there feel motivated. There's a lot of work to be done. The South is saying this. The South is saying, hey, we created a small footprint carbon footprint. The North has created a larger carbon footprint. So we need help. We need help to take care of this. You can't put it all on us. And interestingly, as we come into this whole theme about collaboration, we're looking at collaboration amid, amid an uncertain future. We don't know what the future is looking like. As a there's things going on around us all the time, and so we're having a lot more uncertainties. Need for more courage. And I want to leave you with a quote by Helen Clark. She said, don't give up. We have to make the systems work. Um, and I think the next two people, can speakers, could talk about that, how they made systems work. Um, one thing I did take away also from this last week is that there's a need for modeling at the national level. We have regional models for SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, on how to do it. But nationally, we don't have those models around yet. Thanks, Al. You're Thanks. welcome.
Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Raju, for that insightful um, sharing and presentation that you did. Um, at this point, we would like to invite Julie Gregory for Thanks, her Sam. sharing and presentation. And Julie, please, you know, feel free to also um, tell us more about yourself and what you do. Okay, great. Thank you. You're One welcome. second while I share my screen. All right. Um, so as Al kindly mentioned earlier, I'm a research analyst in the Protecting Civilians and Human Security Program at the Stimson Center. However, I have um, been asked to speak about prior research that I conducted prior to coming to the Stimson Center in, back in 2019 on the potential application of VR to the mediation of armed conflict. So I originally came to this topic because I was wondering how emerging technologies could help support more effective and longer lasting peace agreements. Unfortunately, as conflicts have become more complex and regionalized and internationalized, so too has the durability of peace agreements lessened over time. For instance, between 2005 and 2020, the success rates of peace agreements was half what it was between 1990 and 2005. So this leads to me to think, okay, as conflict evolves, so too must mediation and mediation practices. And so this got me thinking, perhaps there was a way we could leverage emerging technologies in a peace process, kind of like a secret weapon. This is of course, um, when I was re researching it back in 2019, to my knowledge had never been directly applied um, although I'm sure Donish will, will speak to current uses of VR in relation um, to, in, to the UN. So I really became intrigued with virtual reality among all the emerging technologies specifically because psychology studies show that VR has an immense potential to promote perspective taking, empathy, and pro-social behavior. And as a community mediator myself, I felt like those elements could be very helpful in a mediation process, including in the mediation of armed conflict. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, perspective taking as defined in psychology is comprehending or imagining another person's point of view, such as their thoughts and feelings. So in some VR experiences, this can even mean looking at life through someone else's eyes or walking down the street in their shoes. Now, empathy builds on perspective taking, so cognitively understanding the thoughts, feelings, or behaviors of another, but adds in another element, experiencing similar emotions to those perceived in another person. Now, in the context of mediation, this can be helpful, but it also uh, can be less helpful in some instances. For example, if one, one participant in a mediation is angry, having others experience that same emotion may not be productive. Whereas if one person experiences hope and expresses that, that may have a more positive impact. Mm. And then thirdly, we have the element of pro-social behavior, which is action that is perceived to help or benefit others. So to investigate this potential usage of VR, I spoke with both mediation experts, uh, specifically those who had been involved in the mediation of armed conflict to some degree, as well as VR experts, just trying to unpack what their perception is of the possible usage of this fun and useful tool. So um, in speaking to mediation experts, I asked them to do their best to try to quantify how important each of these psychological phenomenons is to the mediation process itself. And in speaking about the about perspective taking empathy and pro-social behavior, perspective taking especially stood out um, as being quite important to the mediation process and also easiest for mediators to promote among the three phenomena. As one mediation expert said, if you, a conflict party, cannot take the perspective of the other, 
or begin to take their perspective or understand how they perceive you, you will never be able to resolve the conflict. So perspective taking can be highly useful in a mediation context. Um, empathy was also cited as being useful, but that's something that needs that's built on trust and needs to be built over time and requires internal motivation. You know, you can't just put on a VR headset and then expect that user to immediately feel empathy with whatever's going on. They need to be internally motivated and open to that sense of emotion. And then pro-social behavior was described as most mediation uh, experts as just really a step too far. It's extremely difficult to promote, uh, you know, with, and of course we're talking in non-VR settings in a regular mediation process, but they did say in the right conditions, it could look like small symbolic gestures like eating together or sharing a prayer room. And it could also uh, involve more formal things like confidence building measures that show goodwill uh, towards, the, towards the mediation and peace process. Now, in speaking separately with VR experts, ask them a similar question. How confident are they that this technology could help stimulate these behaviors? They know VR the best out of anyone. They give me slightly different feedback. They express the most confidence in VR being able to promote pro-social behavior, so socially beneficial action. And perspective taking was right behind that. They also felt like uh, VR could be very useful for perspective taking. The power of VR really lies in connecting people through personal stories or scenes of daily life, um, which then can lead to positive action after the VR experience. But then in speaking about empathy, um, actually quite a few experts said that they really feel like uh, the ability or capacity of VR to stimulate empathy has been oversold. Um, and it's really dependent on the type of VR experience and how it's designed and implemented. So I thought um, it would be kind of fun to, to give you a brainstorm of some ideas uh, about how I think VR could fit into peacemaking efforts before the mediation table and at the mediation table. Um, and of course, this, like I said, this is a brainstorm, so some more realistic and feasible than others. And I would specifically see these ideas being used um, in tracks 1.5, 2, and 3. So engaging top-level decision makers in an informal setting, so not within a formal process, or using VR, excuse me, with mid-range leadership in mediations or dialogues, and then also with community leaders in peace building or in problem solving activities. So what are some of these ideas? Um, well, before we arrive at the mediation, the proverbial mediation table, this could, VR could really be useful as a training tool for mediators. You know, how does it feel to, to mediate um, specifically within an armed conflict setting. You know, how should you enter the room? How should you greet the conflict parties? Um, how should you navigate those relationships? It could also be a really useful tool to enable conflict parties to experience what mediation could look like. So they can learn about mediation processes from around the world, be virtually transported to another setting, hear the stories of key actors, learn about how the mediation process went, what posed the greatest challenges, what, breakthrough the, what breakthroughs they had, and then what the outcome of the process was. It could also be used to raise awareness of specific conflict issues that they may not be aware of or may not greatly prioritize, um, specifically if um, issues are arising in an area where they cannot easily access. So you could show on the ground realities. What are the specific human humanitarian needs in a local community, et cetera. Um, and it could also be used um, to prep parties for the mediation. So putting on you know, a VR headset, how would it feel to walk in to the room where you would be um, you know, theoretically sitting, sitting in front of um, a so-called opposition. How would you walk in? How would you would you shake their hand? Would you not? What would you say? Um, that could help ease some tensions and emotions ahead of the official 
mediation process. And then at the mediation table, I think the uses of VR are perhaps a little bit more limited just because of a high risk it could pose in, in such a situation. But I do still think there are a few relevant uses and of course, welcome your feedback and ideas on this. I think VR potentially could provide an interesting change in perspective for conflict parties. So when you are a conflict party, you're sitting at the table, you are very entrenched in your narrative um, and it's very hard to step outside yourself, so to speak. And this offers a literal opportunity to step outside yourself. So for instance, you could potentially, um, if everyone agreed, film a short snippet of dialogue from the mediator's perspective, have them wear uh, 260 degree cameras on, on their, you know, a hat or a helmet on their head, um, record that video, and then later they could watch it back in virtual reality to see what it felt like to, to be sitting in an impartial person's um, seat. And then also they could better understand how they come across um, and what, how they're potentially being perceived by others within the room. I think more than anything though, this could be a really useful tool to bring civilian perspectives to the table, specifically when we're talking about humanitarian needs and issues, other grievances, and hearing from traditionally underrepresented and marginalized groups. Um, VR in, uh, grants civilians as well as the conflict parties potentially lower security risks. There wouldn't need to be travel of the civilians. The location of a peace process would not be revealed publicly and you could limit the amount of personal identifiers involved. So before including VR in a mediated process, there's a lot of factors to consider. I'm not suggesting that VR is a magic solution, far from it, but it could be an interesting tool in the right context and with the right conditions and the right actors. So first and foremost, um, you need to have trust between the mediator, the mediation team, and the conflict parties. Otherwise, there's, there's no point in considering VR at all. Um, and then the parties need to perceive that the mediation team has a good understanding of their positions and why they are held. So they need that builds on the aspect of trust there. And then of course you need to consider what is the mediation trying to achieve? Does it align with the mandate? Uh, and is there sufficient time? And will it be worth the cost of putting together a virtual experience? Do the potential benefits outweigh those significant costs? And then of course, if yes, then you need to tap VR expertise to, to pull it all together, to design, produce, and then also to use the, the experience. And then of course, nothing can happen if there's not confidentiality, if VR is not used in a confidential private setting. And if there's not informed consent by the parties, uh, there, there will likely need to be educating about what VR is and the potential risks involved uh, before, before even considering this idea and taking it forward. Lastly, I just wanted to outline some further risks, risks about managing VR in a mediation process um, that should be strongly considered before, before trying it out in reality. So one, conflict, you know, every human could always have a negative physical reaction, especially if they've not participated in a VR experience before. Um, when we're talking about contacts like mediation of armed conflict, it would need to be, we need to be very careful to ensure that the VR environment is not shocking or disturbing for the user. You know, you could imagine if someone saw destruction of property or loss of human life and they have an emotional connection already to that, that could be quite harmful. And then I think there's also the issue of emotional manipulation or even parties perceiving that the use of VR or the experience uh, presented within VR is emotionally manipulative. So would really encourage no voiceovers, music or special effects, just present the reality as it is. Um, and that really draw that really goes back to the issue of trust. If there's not trust uh, with the mediation team or towards the mediation team and the tools and practices they're employing, 
then it's very easy to for parties to to call out whatever they see or experience in VR as emotional manipulation. They could call it disinformation, all of that. And then, of course, uh, using technology that is recording body movement, or if you're recording a video within uh, with a uh, you know with a camera, those need to be securely stored and ideally uh, erased after use. So I want to keep my presentation short and sweet, and I'm also really looking forward to hearing about what DPPA has been up to in the last few years in using VR. Um, so really looking forward to your thoughts and ideas about whether you think this is realistic and whether the potential benefits outweigh the risks. Thanks. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Such a very insightful uh, presentation you did. And again, to our dear participants, um, please save your questions or comments until after our final um, panelist is done with his presentation. So we are grateful to have with us and we would like to call on Danish Alavi for his sharing. Yeah, great. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you to the organizers uh, for this uh, uh, wonderful convening online. Uh, I. And we'll share my screen momentarily. I wanted to uh, say ahead of time that um, I'm today speaking on behalf of myself and uh, not on behalf of uh, the UN, but of course I'll be using or I'll be showing uh, work that's that we did at the UN. Um, sorry, one second. Uh, yes, okay, good. Just trying to see, get it to share. Okay, so I wanted to uh, kind of carry on. I, I feel like it's it's so perfect and it's so nice to uh, really engage with all of you. And of course with Julie uh, and she and I have been in conversation uh, in years past when she was actually doing her um, uh, master's uh, at an earlier time. Uh, and uh, the reason I mentioned that is because a lot of uh, what Julie says uh, sets things up perfectly for some of what I wanted to share. Now, prior to jumping in a uh, whole hog into DPPA's work, I wanted to expand a little bit uh, on, uh, and, I'm, and I did this, I decided to do this sort of last minute on some of the research around empathy and perspective taking. And I do that um, uh, as a sort of way of honoring the fact uh, that uh, uh, Professor Fuertes himself is someone who studied empathy for many years and uh, that does seem to be an important framing to many who are gathered here. So I'm just going to quickly um, show you uh, a little bit uh, in terms of uh, some of the research that's been ongoing, most of it coming from Israel, actually, from IDC Herzliya and others. Um, and this is a, a colleague, collaborator, and dear friend of mine uh, named uh, Beatrice Hasler. Um, and this is a lot of her work, and I'm sure uh, some of you in the audience uh, might be familiar with it. But, uh, you know, when we talk about perspective taking, what are we what are we saying? And this is sort of like a humorous, nice cartoon that gives us a sense of, you know, how uh, maybe the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, now, perspective taking does require ability and motivation, and it can be very difficult to implement in the context of intergroup conflict. Uh, we'll get to some of the things that Julie was talking about in terms of uh, doing mediation in an immersive environment. Uh, uh, for our part, we've actually built a system to do just that, and I'll be showing you some uh, examples of that. Um, uh, now, I mean, of course, uh, it was interesting when Julie was talking about her research, um, and it was it was hilarious to see that you know mediation experts were much more. Uh, sanguine, as the Brits like to say about VR, than than uh, many of the others. Um, I'm I'm not sure if I was one of the voices and that was included in the table. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's for Julie to tell me later. But but I definitely am someone who's been a little bit more on the skeptical side or a little bit cautious. And I think that's uh, driven potentially by uh, you know basically actually running uh, lab experiments uh, at. Um, uh, Max Planck Institute and MIT and elsewhere, where we're actually trying to measure, uh, the, you know, behavioral shifts as a result of VR-related uh, content, VR content-related interventions. Uh, here are some examples that some of you might be familiar with. 
uh, when we talk about VR 360, 360 VR documentaries that use 360 video and you know our form of immersive journalism, of course. Um, sorry. Now, um, some of the research questions that are important now, this really, I mean, I won't read them out loud, but you know, these are, you can just cast a quick eye at them. But these are some of the questions that Julia herself was also uh, talking about and asking about. Uh, this is an interesting experiment. Now, when we talk about zygomatic responses, what we're looking at is how, uh, when, when, you know, the idea is that when we feel uh, profound empathy towards someone, we kind of mirror their expressions, right? Um, this happens sometimes between partners or lovers who kind of mirror each other's body movements, et cetera, et cetera. And here the, the question was uh, 2D versus VR. Uh, and and what, is, what, is the, uh, what is the difference there? And you can see that on the graph on the right-hand side. Um, I'm not, I'm, again, I'm, I'm doing this quickly because I'm not here to offer you a scientific presentation necessarily, but um, just to give you a sense of some of the research, but I'm going to skip through this one. This is the one that I really wanted to talk about. Now, this was an interesting uh, uh, sort of experience. Um, uh, again, done by Beatrice Hasler, Daniel Landau, and some others, where uh, two Palestinians are walking in the territories, and they get stopped by soldiers, and you get to see the VR experience uh, as a 2D version of what happened from the perspective of the Palestinians and from the perspective of the soldiers, and you also get to see it immersively in uh, 360 video in a head-mounted display. And... Um, um, uh, you can see that there were some people who saw it from the soldier's perspective, from the bystander's perspective, and from the Palestinian's perspective. Um, when we talk about uh, uh, phasic SC here on the, uh, on the uh, y-axis here, what we're talking about is sort of physiological response. So as measured by um, uh, galvanic skin response, uh, heartbeat, basically how strongly is a person responding to, uh, to it through the standard set of physiological measures that are used in the field. Again, not to get overly scientific uh, in an otherwise non-scientific gathering, but uh, clearly VR makes, uh, VR is very different from two-dimensional video. And here's the, here's the really interesting thing. Um, um, uh, viewing the scenario from the perspective of the Palestinians who are being stopped by two soldiers resulted in higher levels of empathy, lower levels of dehumanization and lower threat perception, right? Mm. This was published in PLOS One in 2019. Um, but here's the other thing. Um, Elora Azaria was, uh, was someone who was uh, uh, involved in uh, basically harming uh, Palestinian civilians. And people who had viewed the VR checkpoint scenario from the perspective of the Palestinians judged Azaria's actions more harshly and supported more severe punishment for the mistakes he'd made. You guys can look up the case online if you'd like. Uh, this is just a heat map looking at some of the ways in which we can engage in eye tracking and understand um, better what a person might be looking at. And some of the newer head mounted displays allow us to do that uh, more effectively. Um, uh, this is some some work from from my own sordid past. Um, uh, I can see Julie uh, smiling. Uh, basically, we used to I started doing this in about 2012, 13 where we were using um, these old timey head mounted displays, the, the dev kit, uh, for those of you that are in the know from Oculus to get people to swap bodies with each other. So basically what we're doing is exploiting what's called the body transfer illusion in neuroscience research, where we can get a person to kind of come have the experience or illusion of seeing themselves in another person's body. Um, there, there's one last, one last experiment that's super interesting that I wanted to kind of give to you, which is uh, this uh, longitudinal study uh, from 1994 to 2017, which looks at a positive correlation between age and perceived probability of peace. Uh, uh, you know, and, and the N here is huge, right? It's 117,131 Jewish Israelis. Um, and uh, I'm guessing some of our more academic colleagues, uh, perhaps Lisa and others, in the audience know about this one. Uh, uh, but this is, this is uh, essentially what this is saying is that as people get older, they, they seem to be more likely to believe that peace is possible. And younger people, especially in our generation, uh, tend to be more skeptical of the probability of peace. Uh, 
So of course, this is very interesting. Um, here, I'm going to skip this uh, because we can use VR to give people the experience of seeing themselves in an 80 year old virtual body, right? Versus a 25 year old body, right? And um, engage in a kind of embodied perspective taking and, and see uh, you know, uh, if that shifts the hope for conflict resolution. And as you can see, uh, it's an interesting effect here. Uh, the 25 year old control versus the 80 year old. Um, yeah, uh, you know, and then you can do it in different ways, including, you know, of course, looking at yourself in the mirror, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to stop the slide and move on to the, the main one. Now that you guys have like a little, uh, think of it as a sort of an appetizer, if you will, uh, prior to your main here, uh, which is of course, immersive negotiation and peacemaking as presented from the perspective of DPPA innovation. So of course, uh, you know, you guys know we've been at the UN, we have a long, uh, you know, uh, dare I say checkered past of trying to uh, mediate conflicts and develop modalities for dialogue, sometimes successful, sometimes not. Um, uh, the, the unit that I have uh, most recently served um, is, uh, you know, our job was to look at future trends and look at emerging technologies and see how they can be used to enhance peace peacemaking efforts. Um, and often responding to various mandates from the UN Security Council for special political missions and such. Um, uh, you know, we, we obviously think of extended reality as a very useful tool uh, when it comes to conflict mediation, uh, drawing, of course, on some of the things that Julie was saying. Okay, so uh, what are some of the uses that we're interested in inside the UN? Well, the, the, the first use case that we're super interested in, uh, or the initial use case that we considered, I should say, is the future of briefings. And here, um, the, the, um, uh, the reality is in order to make informed decisions, the council, the UN Security Council, which as you, many of you know, is a premier body, uh, though very gridlocked currently, given the global situation, uh, the premier body in charge of make, you know, working toward ensuring international peace and security, they always have to understand the situation on the ground, right? Now, the standard format is, uh, let's say, about 8,000 words, Times New Roman font, 12-point uh, uh, double-spaced, right? Um, is that an effective way to get people to understand what might be going on in a place like Yemen or um, Colombia or Lebanon or Iraq? Um, that combined with the fact that... Uh, uh, Permanent representatives that are sitting on the council are often unable to travel to conflict contexts because of cost or security or logistics. And even when they do, and here I speak from experience having captained, uh, for example, the uh, first time that the UN Security Council went to Iraq in the history of the UN, um, we were in an armored convoy uh, zipping through town, not really engaging with anyone. Uh, this was immediately uh, this was, you know, Iraq was barely post-ISIS, right, post-ISIL. And uh, we were going from ministry to palace to the UN uh, mission, which is highly bunkerized. And uh, so even when you are on the ground, it's hard to get an objective sense of what it's like. And so using immersive technologies, uh, we've actually been able to take Security Council members uh, to um, uh, give them basically uh, an objective sense of what it's like to be on the ground. Here you're seeing the first time that this happened inside the chamber as part of a briefing, uh, and that was Colombia. The first time it was actually used with members of the council outside the chamber was in April 2019, uh, a piece called Iraq 360 um, that, um, that I was involved in directing and making um, that was basically trying to give council members a sense of uh, the situation in Iraq and in Northern Iraq in particular, in terms of displacement, in terms of peace and security, uh, uh, following uh, the sort of counter ISIL operation that had been ongoing. Um, all right. Now, uh, of course, uh, these things are super useful. Uh, you know, the, some of the reactions that are in another slide that I'm not showing you um, from council members involved saying that this is that that's the closest they've been to the situation on the ground um, and that they understood it differently. This is also important in the face of the fact that permanent representatives and others 
who sit on the Security Council are often called upon by their capitals to represent the perspective of the capital and simply repeat a certain set of talking points, speaking very bluntly and honestly here. And this is uh, also an opportunity to get um, delegations to not only see what it's like to be on the ground, but also to reflect on what they want to say in response to what's being presented. Of course, this has to be done very, very carefully because of all the reasons uh, mentioned uh, in the uh, prior presentation around uh, inaccuracies, emotional manipulation and such. And so it's, it's, a, it's a sensitive thing and it's not so straightforward. And by the way, changing the Security Council procedure is uh, hardly the easiest thing to do given how strict and conservative, frankly, the place is, right? Uh, anyway, so that's, that's, that was the initial use case. Now, the, the other use case, and this is the more interesting one, is uh, what Julie was talking about earlier, which is how do we use it for actual mediation? Can we use it as a place to convene? Um, it's important to note here that um, uh, often, uh, especially those of you that have experience with track 1.5, track two or otherwise, there are all kinds of formats. Uh, often there's a, a lot of anger, trauma, differences, polarization, what have you. And delegations are unwilling or unable to meet, uh, unable because of uh, a conflict or cost or travel or restrictions. There's a whole range of things, right? And so an immersive environment where delegations are able to convene uh, a kind of UN in the metaverse could be extremely useful. And indeed, that is precisely what we did. We built a prototype that allows us uh, uh, to have those kinds of meetings in an immersive environment. And the images you're seeing, for example, in the next set of slides are actually images from the immersive environment. So you guys get to see what it's like. Uh, but these could be used for bilateral discussions in order to prepare more detailed negotiations, proximity talks, of course, back channel discussions, both sides, small group interventions, and also, as Julie was saying, to simulate actual negotiation or mediation. Um, they can also bridge participation gaps, right? Where, uh, I, I mean, depending on the delegation, most delegations aren't necessarily the most broad or diverse. Um, maybe they don't necessarily represent uh, every single uh, uh, community that constitutes a particular society. Uh, along various dimensions from gender or, um, uh, to sexual orientation to uh, various other forms of identity. So this kind of environment also makes it a little bit uh, uh, easier for those groups that are underrepresented, generally informal delegations, to actually talk to each other and find ways to inform the bigger delegation. And this, is, this actually connects a little bit to something we can talk about in Q&A, um, uh, you know, and uh, which is what are some of the ways in which we can uh, get broader participation in ongoing you know, mediation processes and dialogues. And uh, here, the use of uh, uh, natural language processing in particular uh, in helping us engage in mass, large-scale, real-time synchronous dialogues is super useful. Uh, and I know that um, uh, my dear friend Lisa is in the audience as well, and perhaps, uh, you know, I might uh, if, if Lisa is willing, she can comment on that during the Q&A as well. Um, this is just repeating more of that. These are, by the way, again, these are all images from the actual environment that got built. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, uh, I, I should add that the environment that we built had a number of features in it that are interesting. One was, of course, different types of NLP integrations that allowed us, for example, if you are speaking Japanese, um, in the environment, and the other person is an Arabic speaker, they can hear what you're saying in Arabic. The system will automatically translate it through a series of APIs, um, which is somewhat interesting. Um, and um, okay, so um, you know, of course, uh, we can do we can do all these kinds of things where we can uh, get diplomats to train or or you know uh, prepare for real world or virtual negotiations and of course for quasi-experimentation. Now, this is super interesting. Uh, and this is uh, one of the ways in which the innovation unit, the innovation cell inside DPPA likes to collaborate with uh, academics like my friend Beatrice Hasler, who I was mentioning earlier, right? Where we can actually work with uh, 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 sort of researchers and uh, run experiments in lab settings where we 
um, create experiences. So once you have the UN metaverse, which we have, um, we can build rooms inside of it where people can have different types of experiences that are, you know, uh, different types of entertainment. There I use that sorted word gamified and um, have people uh, experience different types of interventions that are meant to elicit pro-social behaviors or interventions that we know uh, from a large body of evidence elicit pro-social behaviors or greater intergroup understanding or decrease intergroup polarization, right? So all those things can be done. And when, when we can demonstrate uh, with some authority that um, those are effective in lab settings, uh, they can be ecologically validated in a, in a real world setting where in a more low stakes environment, we might actually test it out. So that kind of approach toward furthering the science of how the intersection of cognitive science, social psychology, and immersive environments is an important part of the work that we uh, do, right? Um, there's, uh, of course, uh, well, uh, the, the, the avatars dimension was also important in terms of representation and getting people to, you know, have different types of bodies. Uh, we worked very hard, I should say, to give uh, the avatars uh, to, to generate a whole of body experience uh, and for the system to track the movements of the bodies, because uh, that computationally is very difficult. So, for example, Horizon Worlds, which is Meta's sort of uh, immersive environment, people are cut off at the waist, right? Uh, in this, uh, we thought it was very important for it to be as natural as possible. Um, uh, the, the, you know, in the, of course, uh, you know, uh, pending approval from an ethics panel, we can also collect biometric and psychometric data. This is again, in collaboration with research labs and social psychologists and other cognitive scientists that we, you know, we're, we're trying to build a uh, bigger uh, uh, body of evidence. But in general, you know, we find that it's important for the UN to establish itself within this new frontier to begin standard setting and interesting guardrails also around this kind of technology. Um, I'll add one other thing here that's interesting, which is that uh, we've also, in the prototype that I have here on my HMD next to me, uh, which is the new Oculus um, headset, um, we've uh, incorporated uh, a form of generative AI. So for example, uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, we've incorporated what are called NPCs or non-playing characters, if you like, um, that um, appear as, as individuals whom you can talk to. And uh, what they are essentially is a, is a version of GPT-4 uh, that's been prompted or, and, and fine-tuned sometimes depending on the experiment to be able to respond to mediators in order to help them prepare for different mediation exercises. So for example, if I'm mediating between Israelis and Palestinians, I can just ask this non-playing character as part of my preparation, uh, can you give me five instances where confidence building measures were effective in Israel-Palestine? And they'll say in 1967, in 73, in this, in that, in, in 95, whatever, right? They'll give you the full list. And you can say, well, look, this is a situation I'm in. Can you give me some ideas for what might be effective? And it's basically you're talking to uh, you're talking to ChatGPT through a series of APIs, and of course, it's a certain it's been prompted in a certain way and fine tuned. Um, and you can do this in any language, by the way, as well. You don't it doesn't have to be in English. It can be in all six UN languages and other languages as well. Again, using some of the other uh, NLP technology that I had mentioned earlier. Um, the final example that I wanted to give uh, is kind of more oriented toward the public and storytelling. So, um, uh, you know, generally when the Secretary General produces a report, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, let's say, international peace and security uh, that gets talked about in the council sometimes, and then it sits on a shelf. And, uh, you know, with, with the greatest respect and admiration for our beloved organization, you know, some of these reports don't get a lot of uh, visibility. And so what are some of the ways in which we can give these things, uh, you know, uh, a little more oomph, get a bigger audience? And so uh, one of the reports that came out a few years ago was a state of global peace and security 
which is a report that had come out of a GA resolution that had been co-sponsored by the South African government, among others, in honor of Madiba's legacy. And basically, it's a, it's a kind of overarching report on what are some of the trends in global peace and security. And so uh, I, uh, I and a few colleagues of mine decided to take that report and build an immersive experience out of it uh, that was a little bit edgy, uh, essentially, and which is funny to say now in the context uh, of, of this week, uh, of the UNGA, but basically what, what happens in the story, it's a story that takes place in VR, uh, is that you're head of state who's about to give a speech at the UNGA, and as you take, as you walk up to the podium, the entire GA hall gets overtaken by a group of students, high school students, who demand a dialogue from you on the basis of what is contained in the Secretary General's report on state of, on state of global peace and security. And that talks about issues such as spending on weapons, as you can see, sea level rise, uh, uh, loss of biodiversity um, and income inequality, uh, and and so this this uh, immersive experience was called the State of Global Peace and Security. Uh, again, I had a role in directing it, uh, but I, I don't even know what that means because I think all these uh, projects are, of course, a collective effort. Um, and this was the first time that. Uh, um, something that DPPA produced was actually part of the Sundance Film Festival, uh, which was a nice thing. Uh, and and again, I say all of this because it's so important that the UN begins to learn ways to tell stories in a more effective way. And I think that, you know, this is another example. And this, by the way, was not 360 video. It was all, of course, uh, actual virtual reality. Now, uh, where are we going now? Our work continues to grow. We're working with neuroscientists, behavioral psychologists, techno creatives, XR production companies, and others uh, to see, you know, how we're going to grow. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, we're, we, we feel that, you know, there's, there's a lot to learn and, and, and uh, we're just at the beginning of all these things. Uh, so with that, I will stop sharing and uh, hand over back to you and, Thank the organizers again for the unique opportunity to share this with you guys. Wow, Danish, thank you. Thank you so very much. Okay, um, now we would like to give this space to our participants in case you have comments. Um, feel free to type in your comments on our chat box or you can verbalize it, you know, just give that. Um, hand gesture there, you know, so we can recognize you. Okay, so we would like to call on Stroya, Fernando, and um, yes, what is your question or comment? And then after this, we will go over um, those that are on our chat, chat box. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to ask a question and for the very, very insightful presentations of all three of our panelists. I have one question concerning um, VR research done on intergroup dynamics. My question is, has there been any research done on the usability of VR on changing of perceptions that are quite entrenched, things like prejudices, biases, um, racism? What would our panelists be able to share about that one? Thank you very much. Hey. Thank you, Stroya. Danish, would you like to? Or no, I, I'd like Italy? to. I'd like to get. Yeah, I've, I've done too much talking, and this is this is a particular area of expertise for Julie. So, okay. Well, thank you. Um, and you're much too kind. So, Danish, please jump back in. Um, so yes, this has definitely been an area of research that's been explored. Um, one one example that comes to mind is on racial bias and exploring um, whether or not how how that can be mitigated um, um, by changing perspectives. So I mean, I have to admit some of this research is in the back of my mind. Uh, so happy to go back to Donish who who works on this on, as a, on a daily basis. Uh, I, so I mean, there's there's a lot uh, the the names that I would suggest looking at, and I can put it into the chat as well, um, is uh, here, I'm putting it in there. Um, so certainly Beatrice Hasler has done some really good work here and you can look up her research, okay? Um, uh, Mel Slater, of course, who's the grand pooba here of, uh, of this type of work. Um, uh, uh, I think 
skip as well, skip Rizzo to some extent. Uh, yeah, I would, I would go with those people initially, at least, um, if you look at their work. I mean, so there's, there's all kinds of work around skin color, around bystander training, uh, uh, you know, um, and various shifts that happen as a result of uh, 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 VR-related immersive interventions. And some of the research is very interesting. I would, uh, uh, though, say one caveat here, which is that when you look at a different bit of research or experiment, when you review these journal articles, try to look for others that, where the effect was reproduced, because I find that there is a bit of a reproducibility crisis in this particular area of cognitive science research. Okay, thank you, thank you. Let me just recognize or acknowledge the comments on our chat box from Seda, it says here, this is really important for humanitarian diplomacy. Although I have a question, would virtual reality scare some people off and negatively impact um, to those people's psychology? I had a blind friend and she had a negative impact on my psychology because I'm an, what is this, empath? And certain things affect me badly. And then uh, from Lynn, who did the South African work? And then Lisa um, has extended her appreciation to this presentation. And then we have one from Alexander. So anyone on the panel with more price friendly, there you go, <laughs> and available virtual reality headsets. This is the logistical issue. So could grassroots organizations move completely online and aim to create immersive experiences to address social inequity or inequality? If so, how do we address systems content filtering and algorithm abilities? How do we address the systemic violence that would come from human to machine interactions? And how do you feel this would impact machine learning? So we would like to address this to all our panelists. Anybody would like to <laughs> take the first move here? I can redeem myself a bit more in this go around, I think. Um, so in terms of the first question about scaring people off and negatively impacting their psychology, absolutely. That's a significant risk and really um, emphasizes why there's a need to do a lot of pre-work ahead of time to make sure that this is an appropriate tool to, um, for each individual who will be using it, as well as for the context within which it will be used. Um, if we're talking about a peace process context, for instance, then I think it's absolutely necessary that um, whoever be using it be, be educated about what is VR, um, what, would the, what could they expect to experience, and then um, ideally even some sort of trial experience before the first real one um, to make sure that they don't have an adverse reaction to it, um, to make sure that, you know, they don't get dizzy or, you know, doesn't cause a headache or, you know, they, if they are an empath, um, you know, they won't react to stronger environments that may be depicting a conflict setting in an adverse way. Um, and then the question about grassroots organizations, I think there's absolutely the, the ability for grassroots organizations to take up VR. Um, and uh, an example that comes to mind is Meet the Soldier, which was actually undertaken by a VR organization, a nonprofit, um, and that as a pilot sought to see whether the use of VR in um, an intercommunal conflict context in Uganda could help resolve tensions between two different communities. So they had um, two tribal leaders virtually visit the other's um, home and land to see what it was like because they'd actually never seen it, to, to meet their friends virtually, et cetera. Um, and they were able to watch this film that was created um, in using a VR headset and then later share that out with both of the communities having an extremely positive impact and leading to the end of violence between these two communities. Other examples, um, the enemy, which, um, was an installation that was done um, that is done usually in a museum setting and takes you around 
um, and you meet different people involved in the conflict and they stand there, uh, the avatar stands there and tells you their story um, and you can interact with them as well. And it's quite, quite a profound experience. So these are all done by, you know, these are examples by nonprofits. Um, so I definitely think that there's, there's room for adoption by others as well. Uh, thank for you, my thank part, you. thank you so much, Julia. I'll add uh, very quickly. Um, so how do we address a system's content filtering algorithm abilities? I think is, the, uh, and how do we address systemic violence that would come from human to machine interactions? Julie has left the best questions for me. How do you feel this <laughs> would impact machine learning? Um, okay, so so I mean, these are, these are really big questions, Alexander. Um, and uh, uh, when it comes to content filtering, I mean, this is, this is a, an area of uh, ongoing research, um, you know, uh, certainly, uh, you know, I know that in the audience, Lisa Shirk is available, uh, sorry, is, is uh, informed and knowledgeable on this particular point. What I would definitely recommend is looking at, uh, well, certainly bridge-based ranking algorithms, which optimize for a different type of content. Uh, which is uh, bits of content that are agreed to or uh, interested uh, or interesting for uh, basically communities that are otherwise on opposite sides, right? So it's optimizing not for content that would make you angrier and put you into a greater eco chamber, but content that uh, is uh, interesting to uh, across various uh, demographic communities, whatever. Uh, dimensions we're measuring those demographies on. That's one bit of interesting thing. There's another thing in terms of the kind of reform that's needed, the kind of change that's needed on social networks, including uh, regulating uh, how these networks uh, and, and platforms uh, structure the, the content uh, rather than policing the content itself. Um, I, I mean, this is a big, big, big topic and I'm, I apologize for being a little bit uh, brief about it, but it, it, you know, but it's it's also a little bit outside the scope of our conversation here. But please, others, feel free to, uh, you know, uh, come in uh, should you wish to say more. Uh, how do we address systemic violence that would come from human to machine interactions, and how do how do we feel this would impact machine learning? Again, this is slightly outside the scope of the present conversation, but I think one of the things we need to look at is, of course, training data and a look at the signal to noise ratio there and certain bits of training data are more important than others. So for example, uh, with artificial intelligence, uh, bits of data that are informing how the system supervises itself, let's say moving forward, that are involved in making sure that the system is aligned with human values, that bit of training data has to have a different signal to noise ratio than others, right? And indeed, those kinds of things need to be taken out of that kind of training data, right? Um, uh, you know, and I, and I think that this is a big area of discussion, but also ongoing research, because in particular, when you build an AI system, the, the key thing becomes, how do you validate that indeed its, its behaviors, in particular, its emergent behaviors are in accord with human values? And this is an area of research for computer science, philosophy, uh, you know, legal scholars, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, these are these are things that are currently being worked on. And literally, if you go to archive.org, uh, uh, you know, as I, uh, you know, sadly do every day now, um, there is a new paper on this issue every day. Uh, I don't know how helpful that is, and I explained it at a certainly at a higher level and in a somewhat more technical level. But I hope that I said enough that you know you're able to find some more answers. Uh, but I'm doing my best to address your question, uh, given the scope of our conversation here. Back to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Danish. Thank you, Julie. Would like to to invite Dr. Lisa Shirt to <laughs> to share with us her comments and thoughts on these um, matters as well. Lisa, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello, Al and Donna. Hello, and Raju, my good friends. Good to see all of you. I am in transit and I am happy to just to listen and I don't really have anything to add. So thank you for calling on me, Al, but I'm going to pass it back to you all. Thanks. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, any any other question or comments from the community? Thoughts, insights. I have some some um, thoughts here, and um, I would like to to um, I'm I'm just interested to hear your your response on this. Uh, maybe Raju, Julie, or and uh, Danish. So we're trying to use um, VR here, you know, to help kind of facilitate the resolution of conflict situations. But I also noticed that most of the conversations going on nowadays, especially as we relate it to artificial intelligence, you know, is the possibility that it might also start to lay off, you know, the human resource, you know. Um, and I would like to believe that that might actually create a new wave of conflict a new wave of, you know, um, another another wave of, you know, um, instability, and what have you. So, how do you how do you kind of what is your take? What is your take on this? And also in response to Julie's um, presentation, um, perhaps one of the limitations of this virtual reality is really the fact that we as human beings, maybe I'm taking it from a psychological interpersonal point of view, is that we are wired to also be physical. You know, I think there is something in in-person processing that perhaps VR cannot capture. You know, for example, the, the, the human touch, you know, and all those other um, human expressions that perhaps are needed, you know, in facilitating the resolution, you know, the coming together of warring parties who are already ready, you know, to make the next step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Al. <clears throat> if I could just interject and then I'll love to hear what Julie and Danish have to say. Um, on the virtual reality, there's... Um, Recently, there was a movie made called Sense. I believe it's called Sense. It's about um, sitting in a chair and putting your glasses on and you can smell all the perfumes. And the whole place has uh, a floral arrangement of roses too. So you can smell the roses. And it's a very deep immersive experience. People came out of that saying they never had an experience like that before. So um, I do understand there's limitations to virtual reality. And I'm also interested to see where it goes in helping people step into other people's shoes. Mm. Julia Danish. Sure. I think like with any technology um, that's new, there's always the possibility for ill-intentioned actors to, to seize upon it and try to use it. Um, I think we're seeing that right now with um, the use of bots and AI and spreading disinformation in different conflict contexts. So, of course, that's always a risk. And we need I think that just emphasizes why we need to be smart about what whatever we're using. Um, and ensure that if there's ill-intentioned actors out there using something, well, we should also be leveraging the technology as much as we can for good uh, so that the technology gets known for its possible beneficial um, attributes, not just how it could be exploited. Mm. Um, but I am also looking forward to Donish's response on this because I think he'll have much more to say. Um, on the physical limitations of VR, yes, of course, that, that is a potential limitation. I have to say in the mediation of armed conflict or similar context, the peace process, physical contact is not usually needed. Um, it, it could be a nice uh, confidence building measure or a nice good intention, for example, to shake someone's hand could be a huge deal. Um, but when you get that far along in the process, and when we're talking about armed conflict, that's usually the end of the process. Um, that may not, be, that's certainly not the start, not the middle, when you need to have some of those discussions. And I think VR um, poses a really unique opportunity, especially when there are geographical limitations around travel um, 
And it also could be physically, it could be emotionally too much for certain conflict parties to sit in the same room. That may be a step too far from them. This could provide them a similar experience, but could help them save face uh, with those they represent um, by, by not having physically traveled and met them, but instead still face-to-face -face met them. Um, and I have to say in VR, it, it, it usually does feel uh, like you're meeting someone uh, if the if the experience is well put together and designed, of course. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Julie. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take all the fun questions. I'll start with the most fun question of all, which is how will AI change jobs and the economy? Well, I, I think that uh, prior to answering that question, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm just going with the flow here, right? So we're not necessarily strictly talking about v, uh, VR at all, actually. We're talking about AI and kind of the socioeconomic consequences of the deployment of AI at scale in society. Uh, I think it's very important in the first instance to understand what current AI is and what it is not, right? What current AI is with large language models is, is a form of, uh, you know, almost like mashup AI, where they've thrown a lot of data together and it's saying, um, you know, statistically, what is most likely to come after this word is this word, right? Um, and and so, uh, you know, Chomsky in his famous New York Times op-ed, I think with some degree of derision called it super autocorrect, right? It's a form of super autocorrect, which is, which is you know, um, uh, you know, not, I mean, it's not a terrible uh, uh, sort of shorthand, uh, you know, to describe it. Of course, uh, when you make models as large as they are, various emergent uh, sort of properties and behaviors, you know, uh, manifest. And uh, that in large part has to do with how effective, uh, for example, GPT-4 is, right, in, in kind of producing content. Um, now, um, is it replacing jobs already? Uh, I think not. Uh, anything that comes out of it needs to be double checked and triple checked. You, you've heard of the famous instances of the legal briefs that were written where it was making up cases, right? So there, it's 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 a complex situation. Everything needs to be checked, and you you I don't think we're at a place yet where uh, you know uh, it's uh, sort of a slam dunk where where AI is just replacing jobs. Now, will that happen in the future? Yes, most likely. Yes, I believe it will. And when that happens, what, happen, what will happen is that we'll have different kinds of jobs, right? We won't have the kinds of jobs that we have now. And, uh, and in that uh, way, in, in some ways, it will follow prior trends, uh, having uh, trends having to do with the advent of a new technology and being deployed at scale in, in society. And in some ways, it'll be different. And in, in, in the, those respects in which it'll be different, those things we have to be very careful about. And so enters the AI safety control governance and so-called mm. alignment problem, <laughs> right? And that's what, what many of us are, are working on. Um, I think that, I think Ju Julie addressed all the other questions, yeah, unless there's something else, but, but I did see another question, yeah. which I'll address preliminarily right here, which I thought was a lovely question from Michelle Rumney. Um, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly or their name correctly, rather. Uh, what post-VR experience feedback do you collect from participants in VR sessions? Now, um, Michelle, that depends entirely on the context. So for example, in an experimental setting where of course, you know, uh, like an ethics board panel, whatever has passed this experiment ahead of time, et cetera, et cetera, you might collect uh, several metrics. So for example, if you're looking for physiological arousal, uh, there are ways to, in the same platform, as a user, a person is experiencing a VR, uh, a piece of VR content, measure uh, galvanic skin response, uh, heart rate, pupil dilation, eye tracking, and uh, you, we can also have an, an EEG or an, uh, an uh, electroencephalogram um, uh, or an EEG device measuring their, their brain waves, right? And that can be done in synchrony and we can see where all the signals peak and valley, uh, which is super interesting, right? In a non-experimental setting, uh, co collecting those kinds of biometric, physiometric, 
indicators, of course, without consent is uh, uh, illegal, unethical, et cetera, et cetera. And so that can't be done. Uh, however, what we do uh, with, for example, ambassadors and senior decision makers and others is that we, we try to get them to self-report how they feel or how they self-report how a particular experience might have shifted their perspective. Uh, and I know that's uh, not nearly as rigorous or scientific, but of course, given the limitations that we're operating under, uh, we might collect that kind of information from them. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> we're already a little past our time. <laughs> this is such a wonderful um, time together. Great um, presentations, too insightful. And I would like to give Raju the um, this this opportunity for his last words. Thank you, Al. Thank you for being the sponsor. Thank you to GMU, Julie, Danish. You guys are very inspiring. <clears throat> and I just want to... I hope the students that can watch this get inspired uh, by the two of you like I have been. Thank you so much for the information. And also, uh, stay tuned because there'll be more going on at the UN for the next few days uh, around AI. And so keep informed. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And in response to Sumin's comment, this is something, Sumin, this is something we can present to the Carter School and any conflict resolution and peace studies school? How can we possibly integrate, utilize, you know, VR, you know, in our degree programs and um, learning processes? Thank you so very much, everybody. And um, our deepest appreciation to our panelists, Danish, Julie, and Raju.